Got it. So I want to start with this definition of ecological forecasting uh, that comes from the, the Clark 2001 paper, uh, which is now getting, uh, getting out there in age, uh, but was really one that was really kind of formative for me and for a lot of the field for thinking about what ecological forecasting was and this idea of, of forecasting being an emerging imperative for a way that, that environmental scientists more broadly can inform decision making and you know so defined as this process of predicting the state of ecosystems their services and natural capital uh, with fully specified uncertainties that ends up being like something that i find you know uh ends up being like 90 percent of the actual work <laughs> uh and contingent upon scenarios for climate land use population technology etc um and and more specifically i I use, just to be clear on vocabulary, because people use the word forecasting and prediction and projection uh, in many different ways. I, I use forecasting as an umbrella term that includes both projection and prediction. And I use these figures kind of give uh, a uh, climate analog to kind of how we think about the difference between a prediction and a projection. So predictions are, are statements about what will happen in the future based on what we know today, such as a weather forecast is a prediction. Well, a production, projection is something contingent upon some sort of scenario. And, and so all long-term forecasts are projections. Uh, Short-term forecasts can be predictions or projections because once you start talking about decision alternatives and choices about management choices, you are making projections uh, under different management scenarios, even if they're on the short term. And so I consider both forecasts. Uh, so, so why forecast? Uh, so I, I think one of the strongest arguments in favor of forecasting and one that is definitely central to, to this week's course is the, the relevance of, de, of forecasting to decision making. And fundamentally, decisions are about the future, about what we think is going to happen in the future under the status quo or under different decision choices. And if we want to inform the future, Forecasts are an explicit way of giving your, your explicit quantitative with uncertainty best guess of what you think is going to happen in the future. Um, and this need is one that's in some sense always been there, but why Clark called this an emerging imperative is because due to uh, climate change, you know, uh, biodiversity crisis, you know, uh, invasive species, huge range of environmental challenges we are facing today, uh, with climate being you know, often the most obvious, uh, a lot of the historical assumptions in environmental management no longer apply. Uh, it's arguable about whether they're ever applied, but um, a lot of a lot of uh, con a lot of concepts in environmental management, and in, in many countries, a lot of laws around environmental management are based on this idea of stationarity. The, the historical flood frequency, the historical fire return interval, the historical species range. There's all this historical reference point to a lot of ways that traditional environmental decision making was done. But we live in an era of era, era of transience. So there is no such thing as a new normal. There will never be a new normal because things will always be changing. There's, you know, mathematically, we you know, stationarity and equilibrium are wonderfully useful concepts, but they're concepts that do not apply to any of our real world management problems anymore. And like I said, arguably they never did, uh, but the rate of change is definitely way faster than it's ever been in the time that we've been a species worried about decision-making and environmental management. Um, yeah. Uh, and one of the reasons that I you know, alluded to earlier became focused on, on what I would call near-term forecasting is this idea that a lot of the modeling that takes place in ecology in particular, probably less so in epi epidemiology, but a lot of the ecological modeling tends to be focused on long time scales. So projections under different climate scenarios that are multi-decadal to multi-centennial. No decision maker I've ever met makes on the ground decisions based on 100 year projections at a three by three degree resolution. It's not the spatial scale that's relevant to them. It's not the temporal scale they're relevant. And you give them IPCC projections, they're like, well, that's interesting, but I can't do anything with that. 
uh, so this this comes for this particular set of survey results comes from uh, the NASA carbon monitoring effort, but it, I think it applies across a lot of different environmental management problems. That a lot of a lot of what we a lot of real world decision makers are making decisions based on daily, monthly, annual time scale information, and that's not the information that most of us have been trained to provide decision makers with information on. So I kind of said, yeah, there's this unmet need. Uh, for forecasts and modeling on those timescales. The other thing that I think makes eco this idea of forecasting really exciting is the extent to which uh, our science has changed dramatically over the last couple decades to make the, this idea of near-term prediction and projection possible. So whether it's, it's changes in environmental sensor technologies, changes in our science to become more network focused, whether that's top down efforts such as neon or bottom up grassroots networks or just changes in data sharing uh, policies and, and, and practices and, and philosophies. Uh, you know, there's just so much more data available now. Uh, for a lot of my work, the, the revolution in remote sensing capabilities is been a complete game changer, you know, literally you know, drowning in, in petabytes of information. Uh, I think NASA's Earth observation capacity is in the process of, it currently is, it generates about five petabytes of data per year. In the next, within five years, will be more like 50 petabytes of data per year. This is truly astounding amounts of information across many different sensing technology. And then uh, I think it's also important in the world of, of forecasting to think about the role of citizen science as well, because the advent of, of projects like you know, iNaturalist and NPN and eBirth like that make data sources available on a, a spatial scale uh, that is not accessible to a graduate student running around in the woods counting things or you know, out on a boat trawling to get the fish. So like you can't, you know, you can recruit you know, thousands and thousands of people over spatial and temporal scales that are, are not possible before. So you have this ability, whether you do forecasting or not, you have this ability to do real-time science that was never present when I was a graduate student. Uh, and, you know, every piece of data I collected for my dissertation was written on a clipboard. <laughs> you know, and now my, I, I basically ramped down all of the field components to my own lab's research because we can't keep up with other people's data. Uh, like. There's no point in me going out and collecting my own data when I can't keep up with the amount of data that I have already. This puts me further in the hole. So the other argument in favor of forecasting is this, I would make the argument that, well, it's not the only expression of the scientific method that forecasting is a, a uh, definitively a, a way, a, an expression of how we think the scientific method works. It's very compatible with that. So the idea you know, in science is we start by forming hypotheses, and I would argue in, in when we make forecasts that we, have, we use uh, models that embody the hypotheses about how we think our systems work. We then use those models to make predictions, and particularly we make predictions that are quantitative and that are specific and thus are more falsifiable than I think a lot of the uh, hypotheses statements that you see in the literature. You know, as an ecologist, I, you, know, you pick up any issue of, of ecology, ecology letters, journal of ecology, whatever, and you go through and you read, you know, what, what constitutes a, a hypothesis statement in ecology these days? I think X will affect Y. Great. <laughs> what does that mean? Or if you're feeling really bold, X will increase Y. Like, bold hypothesis there, guys. That's very different than like, I think it's going to be 25 next Thursday, and if it's not, I'm wrong. I'm being very specific about what I'm predicting, where I'm predicting, when I'm predicting it, down to, and I'm putting an uncertainty statement on that, and if, I'm, if, I'm not, I'm not, if it's not that, I'm wrong. Uh, then this key idea also is then we, so we make the prediction, then we confront it with new observations, and then we update our understanding. So this idea that forecasting establishes not just doesn't just make our, our tests more falsifiable, 
but it potentially accelerates we do, the way we do science by confronting our predictions with observations continuously, again, like I alluded to on the other side, potentially in real time. So accelerating the pace at which we improve science. And, and as we started with the, the decision argument, in a time where we desperately need to get better at making predictions, uh, forecasts also have this wonderful kind of built-in pre-registration. So in a many fields, there's been these, these idea of a reproducibility crisis, you know, classic studies that fail to replicate. Uh, I like to, to joke that in ecology, half of what we know is wrong. The problem is we don't know which half. <laughs> um, but forecasts are fundamentally a, a priori. So you, you know, when done, when kind of done in best practice, you not just say what you think is going to happen in the future, but you put it out there publicly and say, before the present, before the futures become the present, I'm going to put in some public location what that number is. And I can't cheat. I can't, I can't overfit to a future that hasn't happened yet. Uh, and I, I'm forcing all of my va validation to fundamentally be out of sample. You know, you, you know, the only way to cheat is to get to the get a time machine, go to the future, collect the data, bring it back, and see if you're right beforehand, which you obviously can't do. <laughs> so it forces you uh, to kind of get away from some, from some of the practices that lead to a lack of reproducibility, such as like the ease to which you can, re can constantly refit models to past data. You can't refit models to data that hasn't been collected yet. Um, so here's an example that I think, to me, uh, illustrates Kind of, kind of what I said a little bit earlier before about forcing us to be more specific. Uh, I was originally trained as a plant ecologist, and plant ecologists and agronomists uh, collectively have 150 years of practice uh, doing fertilization experiments. You dump nitrogen on plants, plants tend to like nitrogen and grow faster. We know this. <laughs> uh, so, but if I go out right now under a classical hypothesis testing framework and I dump nitrogen on a plot, what's my null hypothesis? Nitrogen doesn't affect plants. That's how, I've, that, that, that's how this standard statistical testing paradigm is built. So forecasts force us to synthesize our previous information. So I would need to, to, to forecast a response to nitrogen fertilization. I need to go back and build a model around that system, synthesize information I already know about that, system and make a prediction that is specific. So I predict 25% increase in growth plus or minus 5%. That might be what prior knowledge says. A 50% increase in growth and a 25% increase in growth are indistinguishable relative to our traditional null hypothesis that just says zero. So in one of these, your model's wrong, the other model, your model's right. And under traditional hypothesis testing, you don't know whether you're wrong or right. Uh, under traditional hypothesis testing, zero response is non-significant. But if you dump a bunch of nitrogen on plants and they don't grow, that's a pretty significant response because we didn't expect that. Um, so, yeah, forecast, useful. Uh, <laughs> oh, problem, we're not very good at it yet. So this is the figure I had in small form earlier. This uh, is a slightly outdated version. But each of these lines is the land component of a different Earth system model. Uh, out to 2100, we do not agree on the sign of the global carbon budget, uh, let alone the magnitude. And for those of you who are, are not used to thinking about the global carbon budget, anthropogenic emissions are about 10 petagrams. Uh, so <laughs> this range of, of uncertainty at 2100 is greater than anthropogenic emissions. I would call it a policy relevant amount of uncertainty. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, so how do we get better? Like, how do you get better? And this is, you know, what was my crisis moment when I realized that like, there, well, a couple things, uh, they're likely all wrong. <laughs> um, you know, we need to you know, reduce that uncertainty but we can't reduce the uncertainty by waiting to 2100 and figuring out which one was right. Uh, also, to, if you want to be really uh, scared, note that none of those individual lines have confidence intervals around them. So none of those models are propagating their own uncertainty. So, so the actual uncertainty is greater than this by some unknown amount. 
because we've never stopped to quantify the uncertainty we have in any models. It could easily be twice that big. Um, but if I make a prediction next year, I only have to wait a year instead of 77 years. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the key idea there is that improvement requires feedback. Any field that's ever gotten good at predicting anything has done so by establishing some sort of learning loop, whether that's a, a very formal mathematical you know, data simulation based learning loop or just a, a human based learning loop where if you predict something, you get good at it by getting feedback about how you're doing. And even in, you know, in expert systems, uh, there's a lot of evidence that if, if, if you are asking someone to predict something that they get feedback on, they get good. And if you ask that same person to predict something else that they've never gotten feedback in, they could be horrible and they could be you know, falsely confident about how they're doing. Uh, and ten, experts tend to be falsely confident <laughs> about how well they're doing. So like I said, the requirement for, for getting good at predicting anything is, is feedbacks. And there's evidence that this, this works. This is an example figure showing uh, the success of numerical weather prediction, um, showing that the, the uh, successful prediction of complex nonlinear systems is indeed possible. Uh, and one of the things that I, I like to point out about this figure, so a uh, couple things. One is uh, that kind of this increase in skill is, is roughly linear. Uh, there's no huge jumps, uh, which is actually in itself kind of interesting because at various points in time, there were massive upgrades to the models, massive upgrades to the computing power, massive upgrades to the observational systems. You know, there, you know the global weather uh, satellites didn't exist here. You know, all the cool radars that you see on apps when you're looking at, you know, you're look, checking the weather to see if the, you know how that uh, storm front is coming towards you uh, on your phone, like that didn't exist here. But when those things came online, you didn't see like this instant jump in skill. Uh, I think, and I'm not the only one that thinks this, that you know, the, the most plausible thing that's going on here is this idea of iterative learning. So every day, and now actually four, four times a day, so every six hours, most global weather centers make a prediction of what the whole world is doing and then get to confront their hypothesis about how the whole world works with observations every six hours. And they've been doing that for decades. So they've had this continual feedback for decades uh, about how they're doing. And I think that's what's driving this kind of linear increase in skill. So a couple take homes from that. One, you only get good at some forecasting something by forecasting it. The idea that, and I, I've heard this from, from many people, our models aren't good enough to make predictions yet. I would strongly argue your models will never be good enough to make predictions unless you use them to make predictions. It's the process of using them to make predictions that allows them to get better, that, that gets you on that feedback cycle. It, it's getting you know, sort of like an analogy to riding a bike. Like you have to get on to get the, to get the training wheels off. You have to do it. Like that, there's no way that you're going to magically like you can't read you know a book or theoretically you know think about riding a bike and then suddenly expect to join the Tour de France. Like no. <laughs> um, you are going to stink at this at the beginning. That's another thing to remember. Like numerical weather forecasting, as we joke about it now, but it is incredibly accurate now. Uh, but it was incredibly abysmal, way worse than chance uh, when it started. Um, so you have to be humble about this. There's a lot of, you know, probably the, I've been at this a while making ecological forecasts, and probably the biggest skill that I've, I've learned is humility. Um, you have to get comfortable with putting predictions out there that you know are going to be wrong, uh, do, including uncertainty statements with those so that you are not misleading people about how uncertain you are. I, I will make the statement many times this week. It is better to be honestly uncertain than falsely overconfident. Um, but yeah, it's, it show, shows it's possible. Okay, so this figure kind of pulls together um, a lot of these different 
components into kind of summaries of kind of three key cycles that I think I think about when I think about forecasting. So one is just the this iterative forecast cycle itself, where we take our uncertainties about the current system, we push those through models to make predictions with uncertainties, we confront those with observations, and we cycle back. So that's kind of this thing that in my lab we iterate on a daily cycle. And actually, didn't when I introduced my, my lab, I didn't kind of give the diversity of things we're doing. Like right now, my lab runs, we run carbon cycle forecasts. You probably would have guessed that by now. We run vegetation phenology forecasts, forest pest forecasts, lake algal bloom forecasts, tick and small mammal forecasts, uh, probably other stuff I'm forgetting. Oh, soil microbiome. So that's actually, ironically, our, our biggest, it's bigger than our, it's computationally bigger than our carbon cycle forecast because we forecast 262 uh, functional or taxonomic groups uh, across North America, well, across the contiguous US. We don't have any data for Canada. Uh, so we have that cycle, then we have this scientific, scient what I call the scientific method cycle, where we're actually not, we're actually improving the models themselves by confronting the hypotheses in them. And then we have this adaptive management cycle, uh, this, this PROACT cycle of, of uh, I forget the PROACT acronym. Uh, we'll get to it later this week. <laughs> uh, yeah, where you gen generate al decision alternatives. Those decision alternatives become the scenarios we run in models. Those forecasts inform the assessment of trade-offs and inform decision-making. But in adaptive management, you have this monitoring component, which provides the data that feeds back into uh, forecasting cycles. Okay, so how am I doing on time? Okay, cool, I'm on time then. Uh, so I wanted to, to kind of dive into a little bit of specifics in order to kind of foreshadow some things that we'll learn about this week. So we think about making a forecast. So the, the place we need to start with any forecast is kind of what I would call a, a now cast. You know, what do we understand about the state of the system right now? So X might be some, you know, pick your favorite state variable of interest that you're interested in predicting. Uh, this might, you know, carbon, fish, you know, disease incidents, whatever. Uh, there's some uncertainty about that right now. We then need to propagate that into the future using some model, incorporating the uncertainty about what we know right now, as well as uncertainty about the, the, the driving conditions between now and then, the uh, uncertainties about the, the model structural choices, um, and uncertainties about the parameters that go into those models. So we integrate multiple sources of uncertainty uh, and there'll be a whole lecture tomorrow afternoon on the different approaches to uncertainty propagation that we use uh, to, to integrate multiple sources of uncertainty and propagate them forward into the predictions we make. We then, at some point, the future becomes the present and we get observations that we need to confront uh, those observations, uh, confront our predictions with new observations and then reconcile them to, to generate our, our new best estimate of the state of the system. And so there's that, so the, in this the idea of a forecast cycle, there's the forecast step, and there's this, what I call the analysis step, this reconciling your most recent forecast with your new observations to come up with your new estimate of what the state of the system is actually doing. And uh, that's kind of, in many ways, the a key art of, of forecasting. Uh, particularly in an inner sense, because, you know, you know, if your forecast is here and your observations are here, you don't just stick with your forecast and ignore the fact that it's no longer uh, matching reality. But you also, it, you know, if you get new observations, you don't just ditch your forecast and restart your model with the observations because the observations have uncertainties with them as well. Uh, so you don't just throw out your model. You want some way of reconciling them. And one of the things that we're going to rely on a lot on uh, to do that is, is the idea of Bayesian statistics. So Bayes' theorem explicitly provides a way of reconciling uh, our forecast, which in the Bayesian context is our prior information about the state of the system with our new observations. So here, you know, here's an example where uh, you know, the forecast is, is very unconfident, the data is very confident, the reconcile, when we reconcile the two, we mostly follow the data, but it's also possible that our forecast was pretty good our observations are really noisy, 
and you know we want to nudge a little bit towards those observations, but we don't want our forecast to be overwhelmed by bad data. Um, and so Bayes has some nice advantages that lead to it being a very frequently used paradigm for forecasting. Uh, one is it's the way that it handles uncertainty works well with what we want to do because it re returns full probability distributions. Uh, so it, it inherently works in terms of uh, probability statements. It has this inherently iterative nature to it. So we'll talk about uh, this afternoon, this idea of, of, of this prior, this observations leading to our, our posterior updated state of the system. And then that posterior then becomes the basis for the next round of inference. It becomes the next prior. Uh, Bayes also has a lot of kind of numerical advantages that let, allow it to handle the complexity of real world data. And like I said, it allows us to capture uh, that inference does not occur in a, a vacuum, that we have prior knowledge about how systems work independent of this next new increment of data. So it kind of, yeah, comes back to that in, inherently iterative nature, acknowledging that you know, no single set data set exists in a vacuum. Uh, Okay, so putting those two together, like I said, we have this idea that forecast should be updated when new data becomes available. We integrate multiple sources of uncertainty, predict them, uh, confront them with new observations, and update them. We do that using Bayes' theorem. Uh, one of the other cool things that can be, you know, a, a nice feature about fusing models and data is uh, the, the ability to to make inference about what are called latent variables. I'll talk about this more tomorrow morning, things that we don't observe directly. So here's an example where uh, each of these dots might represent an individual forecast and in a whole ensemble of predictions. And so again, I, I like, I think about the carbon cycle a lot. So this, this axis, if you can't read it, says fraction conifer. That axis says carbon flux. And so it's implying that across the uncertainty in my forecast that, that uh, Forecasts that had more conifers tend to have a more positive carbon flux. Those that have uh, less conifers have a more negative carbon flux. Uh, the nice thing about whether that is true or not is that you can define the sign convention whichever way you want. Uh, <laughs> um, so this might be a forecast, a bivariate forecast, and you know these dashed lines might be uh, the projection of those, the marginal distributions of these two. So if I project all those dots onto this axis, I have a prediction for the fraction conifer. If I would do the same thing for the carbon flux, I have a prediction for the carbon flux. And let's say I get some new data about the fraction conifer in the landscape. When I actually made this slide, we were thinking about this in a paleoecological context, thinking thousands of years in the past, where we learned about this using fossil pollen. It's uh, much easier if you're doing this using satellites today. Uh, or field work or something like that. But you know, the idea, I could, this thing might be something that I'm easy to observe at scale. This thing might be something hard to observe at scale, but I can use Bayes' theorem to combine my prior information with my new data to get my updated posterior. But the nice thing is because this thing correlates with that thing, I get to update my understanding of the thing I don't observe directly as well. Um, and that idea is actually, very central to actually how numerical weather forecasts work. You know, they have this problem where they have a, a grid covering the whole globe in three dimensions. Do you think they are able to monitor, you know, every voxel in the globe at all times? No. <laughs> you know, sometimes satellites can, you know, go overhead and do column averages. Sometimes you can look from the bottom up from the ground. Uh, but, you know, there's a whole lot of missing information uh, that is inferred across space and time uh, at, at these scales of forecasts. And, and that's a very common thing that you'll see, uh, even with the best monitoring data in any forecasting problem, you have, you have locations with poor monitoring data that you want to make inferences to. So this is kind of allows you to make inferences not just across uh, different variables, but it can also be across different locations. So this might be, you know, ca carbon at one location, carbon at the other location. If the forecasts of the two are correlated because I'm using the same model and the weather is similar and the parameters are similar, you know, the forecasts are similar. And so if I observe one thing, I get to update the other. And so this leads to this idea of uh, 
of using models as scaffolds as way of bringing information together um, this kind of data fusion idea so here you know I might have a vegetation model and I might have you know different types of observations uh, operating on very different spatial and temporal scales and they it can often be very hard to reconcile them with each other directly but if the model that I'm working with knows how to think about each of these I can you know, confuse all this information together so in this case I might have uh, you know, this is an eddy covariance tower. It's a common way of measuring carbon fluxes. It operates at a 20 hertz frequency, so it makes 20 observations per second. Uh, this is paleoecological data. It makes about one observation per century. Try building a machine learning model that puts in these two things at the same time. No, doesn't work. <laughs> these, these time series are not long enough yet to match one of these data points. But the models can know about both. You know, I have satellite data is operating on on kilometer scales. I have you know leaf level measurements operating on centimeter scales. Uh, I have uh, experimental syst I have experimental manipulations. I have observational data. You know, if, if if your models can predict any of these things, you have ways of fusing these sorts of information. And so, in addition to kind of this uh, uh, forecasting loop. I often think about this, this kind of uncertainty feedback loop where I, I spend a lot of time trying to characterize the uncertainties in my forecast and then propagating them uh, into the future, but then also analyzing and partitioning those uncertainties to give me insight as to what are the dominant uncertainties affecting my forecasts uh, and then designing targeted field campaigns uh, in order to reduce those uncertainties. So this slide both summarizes the, the practical challenges of the different uncertainties that affect forecasts, but also I think to me a really interesting emergent question uh, that's gotten me really excited, which is uh, if we want to think, think about what it is actually predictable in nature. So if we have any forecast, we have this uncertainty about where we are right now, and we want to propagate those uncertainties into the future. Uh, so I'm going to take as a kind of given that most of the time where the uncertainty about a forecast is going to go up as you go into the future. If you're more confident about the future than the present, you should probably check what you're doing. Um, <laughs> and then at some point, your forecast doesn't do any better than chance. And that defines, in my mind, this idea of a forecast limit, the point at which your forecast is not doing any better than, than kind of your current best model, your, your null model. Uh, and and if you're lucky, those, you know, the forecast limit overlaps with decision relevant time scales. There's no guarantee that that's going to be true. <laughs> um, so the thing, I would argue, the thing that determines the predictability of different systems really is how quickly does this uncertainty increase with time? So if, if, this, if the growth rate of this uncertainty is very slow, uh, then we're gonna be able to push this forecast limit out into the future further. And if the uncertainty increases very quickly, we're gonna hit that null uncertainty very, very soon. And so what controls that the uncertainty, the, the growth rate of this uncertainty are the different components that go into that uncertainty propagation. So what causes variance increase with time? So this is just a simple uh, linear tangent breakdown of what I showed on the last slide that says the variance of some state variable y in the future is going to be determined by the uncertainties of each of the things that go into that forecast, and then the sensitivities of the forecast to each of those things. Uh, which is a kind of intuitive thing and this just you know, kind of works it out with a little bit more mathematical formality uh, to really say that anytime you want to know about something you need to know the uncertainty going in and how sensitive you are to that and i'm i argue that the five things that you need to worry about in any forecast are the the internal dynamics of the system so that's your uncert uncertainty about the initial conditions what is the state of the system right now uh, your, ex, your sensitivity to external factors, so your external drivers and uncertainties about those external drivers, uh, 
uh, the parameters in your model, uh, how tightly can you constrain those and how sensitive are you to those. But I'm going to further break down the parameters into kind of just what we might think about the uncertainty about the mean parameters and then the inherent variability in those problem parameters. So the fact that in many ecological and environmental problems, uh, there is heterogeneity in systems that we can observe as being consistent in space and time that we can't always explain yet that statisticians love to throw things like random effects at. Uh, so there's this, I, I often distinguish between this parameter variability to capture the heterogeneity in real world systems from just kind of the parameter uncertainty, which goes down kind of asymptotically as you collect more data. And then this residual process error. So I use the word process error a lot. And basically, I mean, you know, all the uncertainty and the difference between the model and the data that's not just the observation error in the data itself. So, you know, there's, whenever you calculate residuals, some of that's just the fact that data is noisy. Uh, and our classic, you know, most classical statistical models assume that 100% of the error is just goes due to the noise in the data. We know that that's not true. We know there are models, and that a lot of that uncertainty is is the fact that we don't know what the true model is. Um, so there's this additional process error. So to look at the the weather forecasting problem as an example, um, there is a case where that first term that I looked at uh, dominates. So there's uncertainty about the initial conditions, and then there's this sensitivity of the system to its own initial conditions which is this classic idea of, of stability. You know, you know we're, we're in a math building and ecologists can't, I love to say, ecologists can't give a talk without a picture of a ball rolling off a hill or into a valley. Yeah, you've all seen that. You laugh because you've seen it. Uh, that's that guy, stability. Same concept, same derivative. You know, all know if that's bigger than one, you're on the top of the hill rolling off problem and your system is chaotic. So Lorenz in the 60s demonstrated the atmosphere is inherently a chaotic system, and that had profound impacts on the forecasting problem. You know, because, because that number is bigger than one, this sets up a feedback group loop where the uncertainty grows exponentially. So the only way to make an accurate weather forecast is to make that initial condition uncertainty as small as possible. Globally, we invest tens of billions of dollars a year in making that initial condition uncertainty as small as possible. Like those cool weather satellites, all those radars, all that, that doesn't exist so that you can have a cool app on your phone. That exists to reduce the initial condition uncertainty as much as possible. Um, that's why we have weather satellites, <laughs> is to solve that specific problem. And, and that, bit of theoretical knowledge, which uncertainty dominates the forecasting problem, then has driven decades worth of practical research and investment for years. I think one of the challenges we face, we don't know for ecological problems, which of those uncertainties dominate. Most of the time, we're not even asking the question of which of those uncertainties dominate. Um, there are examples of chaotic ecological systems, but there's also a lot of examples of non-chaotic ecological systems. A lot of debate, but you know, it's definitely true that there's a lot of stable systems. And, and, and if you're not in a chaotic system, that means all these other things matter. Um, because if this, is, if this is less than one, this uncertainty goes away exponentially instead of growing exponentially. Yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> Um, so I think that one of the key, exciting challenges of ecological forecasting is to discover the patterns of predictability of nature. And so this is what caused me to step back and say, rather than just worrying about carbon, you know, we predict, you know, half a dozen things in my lab. We work with a, a whole group of re researchers globally who make predictions about wide range of different systems. All of these or examples of systems around the world where there are ecological forecasts. And I think of each of them as kind of a puzzle piece. And as we put more of those puzzle pieces together, we develop this picture of understanding the patterns of predictability across systems. So to wrap up, forecasting is more than just forward simulation. It requires the fusion of models and data 
we must address multiple sources of uncertainty and variability when making forecasts. And I'll reiterate this many times this week, think probabilistically. The uncertainties around our forecasts are critical uh, to these theoretical questions. They're critical to not handing uh, decision makers with falsely overconfident predictions when we're still in the early stages of this learning loop. Uh, with that, I only ran two minutes over despite Corinne looking at me evilly. <laughs>